What's up, everybody? If you want to join the greatest online Star Wars community, the Fandom Menace, make sure you hit that subscribe button before today's video starts so you don't miss out on any updates and you're always the first to know when our newest videos go live. The following is a world class bullshit is exclusive. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. The greatest trick that Lucasfilm and our friends in the shill media ever attempted to pull was to convince you that Star Wars was solely for kids. Now from the outside looking in, lightsabers, spaceships, and saving the princess all seem like things that appeal to the young. But they also appeal to the young at heart. And what keeps Star Wars so relevant for all these years isn't the nostalgia, but the deeper themes just under the surface. For a generation, the original trilogy encapsulated the struggle of good versus evil, father versus son, transgressions versus redemption. Nearly two decades later, the prequel trilogy attempted to do the same thing, to varying degrees of success, but ended on a high note. Come 2015, and well, Star Wars just isn't Star Wars anymore. There are multiple reasons why the formerly greatest franchise of all time is in the toilet these days. Bad script writing that's too reliant on bad nostalgia, poorly conceived characters that are protected by political ideologies of the creators under the guise of being progressive, and anti-consumer sentiment by the creators towards fans. In 2015, the world was duped into believing that The Force Awakens passed for an original piece of work. We were lied to. Then the media told us The Last Jedi was a masterpiece, and we were cousin-loving hillbillies for not getting it. Again, we were lied to. Now that all else has failed and we're constantly bombarded by disappointments in regards to Star Wars, a new lie arises in an attempt to silence detractors i.e. haters for the intellectually challenged. What is that lie? What is this bulletproof defense to shut up anyone who even dares question Lucasfilm in the direction they're taking Star Wars in? It's a lie as old as time and equally as shitty. It's a lie that Star Wars is strictly a children's property. Now I know what you're thinking. Toys, video games, bullshit TV shows, all kid stuff, right? Maybe, but not exclusively. Now before those of you who we dare not speak your name get all flustered, the purpose of this video isn't to call for a more mature Star Wars. The amputations, decapitations, and murder of children was enough. What I'm trying to get at in a roundabout way is, stop saying Star Wars is for kids to deflect from valid criticism. The It's for Kids defense shows critical thinking being outweighed by nostalgic loyalty, apathy, or stupidity. Man, that felt good to say. I think it's time to close it up. So folks, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, share it, and in all seriousness, I decided to take a deeper look into the situation. I found statistics from a reputable source, and we know here on this channel that the numbers do not lie. Quantcast, an American technology company that specializes in AI-driven real-time advertising, audience insights, and measurements, found that a typical Star Wars fan is likely male, aged 18 to 44, watches science, history, and horror TV shows, and works in IT or legal. With that profile in mind, they then use that data to find out the most popular characters of the franchise due to the impending doom, I mean impending release, of The Force Awakens. Here were their results. This is a chart for the popularity of Star Wars characters based on Quantcast views of URLs including Star Wars and the character name from October 19th to 25th of 2015. In last place we see Finn, then Rey, then Darth Vader, then Leia Skywalker. Kind of an odd way to describe her, but alright. Then Kylo Ren, Han Solo at number two, and number one was Luke Skywalker with over three million views in that time frame. You can dig a little deeper into Quantcast's data yourself, but they are a reputable source and very unbiased. While we're on the topic of numbers, let's take a look at the box office for Star Wars. When adjusted for inflation, you find that Star Wars has cleared about $7.3 billion domestically, not a bad haul if I do say so my damn self. Now the reason I bring this up is to make a point. With ticket sales like this, there's already a built-in female audience for Star Wars. There's no way Star Wars would have been this successful if there were only men watching it. This is also another problem with Star Wars. They attempted to turn it into something that it wasn't meant to be. To attract an audience that doesn't exist. It's great and noble to want to expand your brand, but with Star Wars, they're doing it at the expense of the pre-existing fanbase, i.e. the ones who spend money. Any time that this sort of argument is brought up, you hear the words racist, sexist, homophobe, etc. The true vocal minority of those deriding the original trilogy had a very loud voice. They have spent years trashing the original trilogy characters in an attempt to elevate new characters. The argument that Luke is a Mary Sue is often brought up, but that's straight up wrong. For those who are new to this channel, welcome and thank you for subscribing. And if you don't know what a Mary Sue is, let me give you a brief refresher. A 
Mary Sue is an idealized and seemingly perfect fictional character. Often this character is recognized as an author insert or wish fulfillment. They can usually perform better at tasks than should be possible given the amount of training or experience and usually are able, through some means, to upstage the main protagonist of an established fictional setting, such as by saving the hero. Now let's see how this applies to Luke Skywalker. Gets beaten up in his first fight with the Sand People. Gets beaten up in the Cantina. Gets scolded by Han Solo on the Falcon. Gets shot by the training droid before blocking his first attack. Isn't very effective in combat on the Death Star. Takes great pride in finally getting off a shot on a TIE fighter after escaping said Death Star. And never faces the main villain. The only thing Luke achieves is destroying the Death Star because flying is the only skill he was mentioned having. Who said it? Obi-Wan. Biggs. Luke himself. He flew his ship well because it was something he did back home for fun, and he only succeeded in destroying the Death Star because Han Solo saved him in the last minute. And that's all in the first movie. He fails his way through The Empire Strikes Back, only succeeding in the one thing he's already great at before the series started, flying. Now on the other side is Rey, who fits the very definition of a Mary Sue. Some would argue she isn't, but I think they'd be wrong. She faces very little adversity, defeats the villain in their first encounter, and magically has the answer for all the film's problems. The Force Awakens would be a much more interesting story if she wasn't in the film, because the characters would have actual problems, instead of relying on Reosex Machina to solve them. This is pertinent, because any time this was brought up, you had really dumb people try and defend her and the film, but the only way they could was to deride the original. Can't elevate without tearing down is their mantra. I know it was Disney's intention to drum up as much business as possible, but let's not kid ourselves here. Any money brought in by The Force Awakens was a result of Return of the Jedi, not Disney's great achievement in introducing new Star Wars characters. After we lost Han, The Last Jedi brought in a lot less, and now that Luke's gone, well, expect the same. Not everyone who sees the movie follows everything online, so they may not be aware that Luke Skywalker is coming back. Now that the writing's on the wall, they move back to what worked for preservation of the brand, the original trilogy. This article from Sci-Fi is what got me thinking about this entire topic. Star Wars Weekly, here's how to get your kids into Star Wars and the original trilogy. The new Star Wars YouTube show Galaxy of Adventure began to roll out over last week and we got a look at some of the most iconic moments in the classic trilogy through a new lens. Dialogue, sound effects, and music is taken from a variety of sources and repackaged together to tell new vignettes in a brand new style. Lucasfilm is positioning this as a way for adults to introduce Star Wars to their kids in a way that meets them on their level. And that's not a bad thing at all. The animation is gorgeous. Your opinion, pal. And it moves with an elegance I'd never imagined I'd see in Star Wars. Whether or not they'll add up to something worthwhile that will bring kids to the saga is something that remains to be seen. But for those of us invested in the universe already, these are fun ways to while away the time and look at Star Wars a little differently. So why aren't kids aching to watch the sequel trilogy era characters? Why has Disney chosen this route? Because if all else fails, the adults will watch out of curiosity. Not that great of an article. I wonder who wrote it. Brian Young. You know, I'd like to voice my displeasure with him on Twitter. Hmm. Well, we've never spoken to him. I wonder why he blocked me. Oh well, no skin off my ass. Star Wars Galaxy of Adventure is an interesting concept. Take the best of Star Wars and sell it to the no attention span generation. I bet kids are eating it up. Honestly, we get better numbers than this. It's great to want to take the original trilogy and introduce it to a new generation, but I know that deep down, Disney is aware that it's the only marketable part of Star Wars. I was out on a little field trip when I found the new Galaxy of Adventure figures, and well, I think you should just see them for yourselves. Ah, so here we are, back in my local Walmart, and here are the Star Wars Galaxy of Adventure action figures. We see Han, Yoda, R2-D2, let's take a better look at Yoda. Over here we have uh, Chewbacca, which is cool. Now these figures are 10 bucks a pop. They're very small, they only come with one accessory, but they come with a comic. Down here we have Princess Leia, so she's from The Empire Strikes Back to match Han Solo. And up here we have Luke and Darth Vader the hero and the ultimate villain of the saga. The problem really comes down from Disney charging Hasbro so much with the Star Wars license. With Disney wanting a new era of kids to get into the former brand of brands, they should consider the entry price. At that price, you push out the kids. The figures aren't bright and colorful, they're small and they lack accessories of something like a Ninja Turtle. On the toy front, Disney is its own greatest enemy. If we look at another form of entertainment, comic books, we see the same tactics at play. Marvel celebrates original trilogy icons with Star Wars Age of Rebellion. Original trilogy fans, these are the comics you're looking for. 
Marvel's Star Wars Age of Rebellion, a special series of one-shots written by Greg Pak, will celebrate rebel princesses, Jedi masters, and more legendary heroes and villains from the time of the Galactic Civil War. While the series doesn't launch until April, StarWars.com is excited to offer the first look at its kickoff titles. And as we can see here, we have Star Wars Age of Rebellion Princess Leia, Star Wars Age of Rebellion Grand Moff Tarkin, Star Wars Age of Rebellion Special, and Star Wars Age of Rebellion Darth Vader. Being a business that doesn't care about money, I'm surprised that Marvel Comics leads off with the original trilogy characters and not Star Wars Tales of Tico. Looking at the age of comic readers, we find that the average reader is in their mid-30s. This information comes from a Newsarama article, Surveying Comic Shops. In another article from Bleeding Cool, we find that 63% of comics and graphic novels are purchased by men, 37% by women. However, in comic book stores, that rises to 72% male, and an older audience. Furthermore, the entire comics market is 69% white, 12% Latino, 10% African American, and 8% Asian. The comic shop demographic is 71% male, 13% Latino, 14% black, and 5% Asian. Hmm, I'm starting to see a correlation here, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Let's talk about something else for a moment while I try to figure this out. Star Wars and video games have gone hand in hand since The Empire Strikes Back hit Atari 2600 back in 1982, and since then we've seen countless Star Wars games from handhelds to consoles to PC, all ranging from iconic to terrible. Recently we've been treated with some terrible games and some terrible corporate decisions. In May of 2013, EA signed an exclusive deal with Disney for the Star Wars license. In 2015 we saw the fruits of their labor with Star Wars Battlefront. The game was released to an okay response from fans and critics. In 2017 the sequel was released and uh, whew, that story was much different. The only thing Star Wars Battlefront 2 managed to do was piss a lot of people off. I mean, if you look at the fan score, 1.1 based on 7,903 users, and I don't recall any Russian bot accusations either. People were just mad. Battlefield 2's failure stems from corporate greed from EA and Disney and these little things called loot boxes. Even to this day, there are issues surrounding Star Wars on the video game front. Now, I do place blame on Disney for EA's mistreatment of the Star Wars IP because they chose EA. They went after the big money and it failed. I'm not saying you need to award an indie darling the license, but try and look for a company with a better track record. Yeah, their games make money, but they're a garbage company. They use their power to buy up everything and put out a shit product. They're the only game in town when it comes to the NFL license because they bought exclusivity rights and stopped 2K from putting out a better game each year. They couldn't win with a superior product. You guys are also aware that EA won the worst company in America, right? It seems like EA and Disney are a match made in heaven. Someone who didn't put up with EA's bullshit was Gary Whitta. Who? Gary Whitta, the writer of Rogue One. You know the only good Star Wars film released during the Disney regime? And good is generous to some. When he found out about the recently canceled Star Wars game, he had this to say. It has been catastrophically mismanaged. If I were Disney, I'd be fucking furious. I saw a bunch of that game, and it looked terrific. It would have been Star Wars Uncharted. Star Wars Uncharted? I love Uncharted. Seriously. I beat them all twice. A game like this could really save Star Wars' neck. Thankfully, there's no more information about the game out there. I'm sorry, apparently there is. The open world game was supposed to have various planets that players could explore to their heart's content. It would feature both new and old characters from the franchise while offering fans a chance to take on the role of bounty hunters while they traverse the galaxy with an adventurous spirit at the forefront. Codenamed Orca, the open world title was originally intended to be very diverse in the zones that players could explore, balancing the edge of both new and familiar becoming a bounty hunter provided a gray area for fans to explore. Interplanetary Star Wars 1313? Oh, come on! That sounds incredible! That's the sort of thing that would bridge the gap among fans. I... I shouldn't be too upset. We are living in the Disney era, and this does pass for a Skywalker these days. You know something? I just remembered what I wanted to tell you right before we started talking about video games. It was a statistic about... Video games. Did you know that the average gamer is 34 years old? Yeah, hardly kid stuff. When you look closer, you, you start to see a correlation. We know that the average age of a Star Wars fan is roughly 18 to 44 in male. We know that the average age of a comic book reader is 35, over 63% male and mostly white. And we also know that the average age of a gamer is 34 years old. When you put this all together like a statistically accurate Megazord, or Voltron, you see that the consumers of Star Wars and all the related media are older white guys. The same exact demographic that Disney and Lucasfilm and Marvel Comics attempt to shit on almost daily. 
What a dumb business move. The Star Wars is for kids myth is just that, a myth. It shows critical thinking being outweighed by nostalgic loyalty, stupidity, or apathy. Saying Star Wars is for kids is not a vibranium shield that's going to deflect Disney Star Wars from criticism. It can't. Because we have the numbers, and they do not lie. Anytime someone, be it a shill or just a misinformed fan, tries to use this argument to shut you up or shut you down because you critique what you consider to be lacking, smack them with the facts and watch them scramble. Disney knows who buys Star Wars. They attempted to grow the brand, which is all fine and dandy, but they tried to do it at the expense of the original characters and the fans. And that's just as bad across the board. So if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, share, and tell everyone about world-class bullshitters. One thing you have to take into account is that Star Wars has always appealed to people from every walk of life. It was already pretty diverse. A company should just be thankful that they have a product that's so popular. But this social engineering campaign that Disney has attempted to do for the last four years hasn't worked on any front. And we're now getting numbers all the time about mismanagement and failures on the Star Wars front restructuring of film release dates, outright cancellations of video games, and action figure waves that are being sold exclusively on eBay to move the product because they can't sell at retail are all signs that the galaxy far, far away is not as bright as it once was. But I want to know what you guys think about this information that I've brought to the table and what's your take on it. Do you hate when people try to use the defense that's just for kids to kind of shut you up? Because I personally do. Uh, does that mean that kids should be given stupid entertainment? No, I'm a proponent that kids should be given complex things that they can work through to help build their critical thinking skills or something along those lines. I mean, look at Batman the Animated Series. That show had a lot going on, and to this day it's still entertaining as an adult. So that's what I feel a lot of these companies should be shooting for, a Batman the Animated Series. Something that appeals to kids, something that appeals to everyone from every walk of life, but doesn't talk down to the audience. But that's it for today, folks. If you're a super fan of this channel, join our Patreon page. A buck a month goes a long way, but five bucks, which is only 17 cents a day, gets you access to all kinds of exclusive digital content. We do an extra podcast every Thursday night called World Class Bullshitters After Hours. It's raw, it's uncut, it's funny, just like the main podcast, but sometimes we talk about things that maybe don't belong on YouTube. We also do commentaries. You guys can request them. We give you extra stuff all the time over on Patreon. But if you can't afford it, that's not a problem. Just join our Facebook page. Get involved in the community. Have fun. We are the Fandom Menace. We are the World Class Bullshitters community. And it's the best one on the internet. So get involved, make some friends, and have some fun. I'll be back later in the week with more content. And as always, folks, be excellent to each other. Music